as many of you know, I've been in the Bible studies and stuff, but just always asking for prayer. My um, brother-in-law um, went to the emergency room last Friday because he had gotten an upper respiratory infection and then he had gotten the flu on top of that. When he got there, he was septic and they were really worried it was attacking his heart. And we had gone from there to ICU and he had several surgeries and they kept telling us that he wasn't surviving, he wasn't gonna, he wasn't gonna live. He um, had infection attacking one side of his entire body. So they, after the surgeries, they said that they weren't going to have any other surgery and they were going to let him just die in peace. So they took, took all of the tubes and everything out. They stopped the antibiotics and they said, you know, he'll pass quickly. And he didn't. And then they sent him upstairs and they said he'll, he'll pass quickly. And he didn't. <laughs> and Two days later, they said he'll, he'll, he'll have passed by now, and he has it. And hospice came yesterday, and they said he doesn't qualify for hospice anymore because he's thriving. So we've gone from planning a funeral to just this amazing praise. <laughs> but <laughs> five o'clock tonight, wherever you are, we are asking everybody just to please pray for him. His name is Paul Hathcox. He's got a lot of work to go, but whatever God's plan is, we're taking it. <laughs> Amen. But Hallelujah. thank you, guys. Come on, Judith. Come on, Judith. Come on. Can you say hello to Judith? Amen. Step right here. Right here. Judith has decided she'd like to give her life to Jesus. Come on, Judith. Step on in there. Yes. Oh. Yep, you're just right. Would you join me in praying for Judith real quick, please? Oh. Father, thank you for this amazing moment. Thank you for this beautiful person's life. Thank you, Lord, that you've created her in your image to be like you. Thank you, Lord, for invading her heart and uh, giving her new life. Help, thank you, Lord, for convicting her of uh, the, the need for you, Lord. And Lord, I just pray your great blessing upon her life. Lord, I pray that you would fill her with your spirit, that her relationship with you would flourish, that it would be a, her greatest addiction right now from this point forward would be, would be toward you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would help us to love her and love her well. I pray, Lord, that you would use her not just uh, to, to, to get better, but Lord, that you would use her for mighty works for your kingdom. Lord, I pray that the same comfort that you've given her right now, that she'd be able to use it to pass on that same comfort to others, Lord. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you would bless her, and I pray that you would help her to remember this very moment for the rest of her life. Lord, help us to come around her and love her and encourage her all the days that she is here with us. Lord, thank you for choosing this church, Revolution Church, for this amazing moment in history. Bless her, Lord, as she makes this decision for you. In Jesus' name. Can you crisscross for me? Is there anything you'd like to share with anybody? If you Yes, I would. I, I just um I just need freedom. I need freedom from certain things. So I'm gonna believe that this is gonna free me. Amen. Who here in the house believes that who the sun sets free is free indeed. Yeah. Amen. Who would agree to love her unconditionally? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Who would, be, who would agree to, to give her an ear when she needs someone to talk to? Who would agree to pray for her whenever, she, whenever the Holy Spirit convicts you of, of her face? Right here, remember this face and lift her up in prayer. Awesome. Who's your one and only Lord and Savior? Based on that confession, I now bury you with Christ, and like him, you be raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. 
<laughs> Could you show it to the bathroom, please? Awesome. Be careful, the cement is slippery. Praise God for what he's doing. Awesome. All right, why don't we give it up? To, you know, God is, is working, and, he, and look what he's done in Judith's life. Can we just praise him, please? Can we praise him? Awesome. So good. So good. L that, listen, when, when, we, when we talk about an offering, that's what we're talking about right there. For that. It's for that. It's for that. It's for life change. It's to advance the kingdom of God. And you got to see it right before your very eyes. I'm so excited about that. Uh, and I just want to let you know that the water is there. And at any point today, if you have been kind of wrestling with this you know, I should get baptized, and I haven't, and I, I know I should, and my mama told me to, and I've been a stubborn, rebellious thing my whole life, and I just haven't done it. Or how about this? Maybe you, you became a Christian, and, and things just aren't going that well, but maybe you haven't been baptized. There's people in this room, I guarantee, that are Christians that have never been baptized. Don't wait. Don't wait. Let me tell you why. Sometimes when you're trying and trying and trying and you keep going like this up against the wall, it's because of a lack of obedience. And sometimes when you finally give in and let go of that thing, all of a sudden God's up there in heaven with his, 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 his cloud of blessing. It's just bursting and waiting to dump on your head. And he's waiting for you to go, listen, listen daddy, I'll finally do it. Okay, boom. Maybe. So I just want to let you know that if, you like, if you're feeling that, and you've been stubborn, and I know that none of you are. But if you are, maybe have a hint of stubborn rebellion in you, and you just want to finally be obedient, just please let me know. Like, I'll stop talking, and we can just go over there and do this thing, okay? We got plenty of towels, I think. Well, there were. There was lots of them. We'll figure it out. We've had people come in here, walk in with their clo street clothes. They walk out dripping. They have no towel, no change of clothes. But I think God would honor that, right? It'd be awesome. It'd be awesome. Do me a favor this morning. Open up your Bibles to uh, Luke 24. And uh, don't just sit here and listen to me. We're a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. And it's a great honor every week to say, open the Word of God. And so there's Bibles all over the place. Just go ahead and grab one if you don't already have your own. And you can open up one of your fake Bibles if you want on your computer. And that's fine, too. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. God can love those people as well. There's just something about the pages, right? Anyone a page person? I'm a page person. I need to, yeah, I, I just need to highlight and write and all that kind of good stuff in there. And anyway, I'm just messing with you. But open up your Bible to Luke 24. We're going we're gonna to read uh, verses 1 through 9 here in just a minute. But as you're turning there, I just kind of want to review the last couple of weeks where we've been here in our church. And I know that there's some new faces here, so some of this is kind of new and you haven't really heard it, but use it to catch up a little bit so you can be prepared for today. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I got up and I preached a message that really it's not preached in church too often. And what I did is I, I painted a picture the best way I could, and maybe you didn't like it, but I hope that it was clear, of the absolute universal basement of despair that every single human being is born into. The Bible says that, that at the moment of conception, sin entered your body. And so this is the passive recipient of a sin nature, and there's nothing that you can do about it. Nothing. And that's bad news. But we need to get to a place of utter darkness, right, so that you can appreciate the light of what Jesus can do for you. So we bring you down into the basement, there's nothing that you can do to get right with God. You are absolutely helpless, every single person. Then I, I was so nice, I took the week off afterwards and left you in the basement. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but we had a great time in South Carolina, and we got to go up and see my stepson, Blair, and his wife, Maddie, and that was cool. <clears throat> and when I was absent, Jay knocked it out of the park, man. Right? It was awesome. And he talked, about, he talked about some of the things that we're not saved from. Like, you know that when you're saved, you still have some doubt? Do you know that when you're saved, you still have temptation to sin? Like, it doesn't just automatically all get better 100% when you bow the knee to Jesus. And so Jay took us there 
And then last week was my favorite week of the year. Last week was the, was the week we celebrated Jesus going to the cross, and he gets up on the cross, and he utters the three most famous, high-impact, powerful words that have ever been spoken. And can anyone tell me what that is? It is finished. And what does this mean, though? What does it mean it is finished? And so we kind of went through a couple different things. The first thing was that the story is finished. That the story of the redemption of the human race has been completed on the cross by Jesus Christ. That he'll continue to make you a little bit more and more like him day to day. But all that you need to be right with God is done on the cross. We also learn that the sacrifices are done. Like all of us do stupid stuff, right? Raise your hand if you do stupid stuff. We all do stupid stuff, and God knows we do stupid stuff, and so he gave his people, Herb raised two hands. <laughs> two hands. Let's do the wave. We're all stupid. You ready? Whoa, yeah. Why would you even agree to do that? That was awesome. So, so, so we, we realize that, that we all do stupid stuff, and God realizes we do stupid stuff too, so he comes up with a sacrificial system. And so you have to make these blood sacrifices to appease God in the temporary. But the Bible says that that's not going to really cleanse us. It's just going to appease God for a, for a moment. And then every year, every day, over and over again, keep sacrificing, keep saying I'm sorry. But we learn that Jesus Christ on the cross, one sacrifice for all people, for all time, for all sin. Amen? That's what happened. That, so in that case, it's finished. We learn also that the separation is finished. That means Colossians 1.21 that says that because of your sin, you were his enemy and separated from him. We realize that we're separated from him, and so what God did is he gave us some priests, right? He gave us priests, and these priests would intercede. He'd come between this holy and perfect God and these sinful people, and he would offer sacrifices on their behalf to make you right with God. But it also says in the next verse, verse 22, that because of the death of cross, of Christ on the cross. It is finished that he has brought you into his very presence, holy, blameless, and without a single fault. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. This is massive, massive life-giving way. We also learn that sin's control over your destiny is finished. That when you, when, you, when you became a person, when you were conceived, like I said, you, you have this passive recipient of, of sin into your bloodstream. And that sin and death passed into every single person. That's just the way it is. But the Bible says that when Christ went to the cross, sin and death no longer had power over him or you. Amen? Amen? We also learned that Slavery is finished. Slavery to the fear of dying. Our genome is to protect ourselves. That's what we do. We try to keep going and we juice and we exercise. You can juice all you want. I'm eating steak and bacon. <laughs> but we try to live as long as we can and be as healthy as we can because we only have this life. We only go around once and so we want to make the best of it right here. Why would we invest in the temporary when we have eternal glory promised us? And so when you don't fear death anymore, that's freedom. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. But if Jesus dies and he stays dead, you die. And there's no hope. And there's no heaven. And if Jesus dies, well, then he's not the strongest, toughest, most powerful entity in all the universe. That means something stronger than him. And if that's the case, he's not worthy of worship. And if that's the case, he's not worthy to be followed. So in a sense, it is finished could be a bad thing. But my favorite word in all of scripture is but. But. Luke 24, 1 through 9. But, very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Now, before we go on any further, I just got to remind you, if you're sitting in a table, you're in the amen section, amen. right? That means you have to be loud and proud. Because if, they, if you don't get fired up, if you don't get fired up, they're not going to get fired up. 
So it's on you, okay? If you're in a table, you're in the amen section. You get fired up about, listen, singing and dancing before the Lord is okay. I don't know about your Catholic little background, but in this church, you can sing and dance before the Lord. You should be happy. He rose from the dead. He's alive, right? So that's your section right there. That was a pretty good one. That was pretty good. Okay, so, so they went in, these ladies went in, but they didn't find a body. They didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men, the two guys in robes, dazzling robes. It was, I think it was like Ric Flair and the Macho Man. I'm just, woo! I'm just kidding. Blasphemy. So then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee? Remember? That the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. How do you forget that? I'm just wondering. No one's ever said that before. And they forgot, oh yeah, that's right, yeah, you said you're going to raise from the dead. That's right, yeah. I thought I had a bad memory. My wife always picks on me about my memory, like, what about these guys? <laughs> then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else. That's a word. That's for you. Go tell everybody. That's what I'm here for this morning. That's what I got dressed early and shaved and got dressed and, and rushed down here this morning to tell you that the grave is empty, that the tomb is empty, and that Jesus lives. That's what I came down here to do today. I hope that you will as well. I hope that you will as well. So, so the ladies, they go to the tomb, right? And it says that they were, they were looking for the living among the dead. And it dawned on me while I was reading this, I read it several times, and as I was reading it, it dawned on me that, that really all of us do that. You know, all of us do that. Let me, let me take a minute to explain it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something this morning that if you're part of this church, you know that this is going to rub me the wrong way to do this because I don't like to talk about me or my life in any way because really, at the end of the day, I really am not the guy that could change your life or help you in any possible way. That, that's God's job. He has the power. He has the ability to really transform a life. And so stories about me, not really that big of a deal. But the word of God, we need the word of God for sure. It's what, it's what we need. So we crack it open every single week that we gather. You know, the Bible says that, that, that those who, who delight in the law of, of God and meditate on it day and night, they're like a, a tree planted by the river and they bear much fruit in every season and their leaves never wither and they prosper in all that they do. And that's what we want for you. That's what God wants for you. So we crack open the Bible every single time we gather. We don't need to hear stories about me. But you got to hear me out because I was, I was studying to prepare for this week and, and I'm not the most like charismatic guy in the world and I don't hear the, vo the audible voice of God, you know, like, like Moses, like the, you all watched the movie probably last night, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that doesn't happen to me. It's not Moses. Like I don't hear that. But, but, but I sensed in my spirit that God was telling me that he wanted to use my train wreck of a life as a bridge to connect you with him this week. I, I just need to do that, but I don't like to do that. But at some point, I, like I've shared with you, have to understand that, that the word of God has more weight than anything I like or feel or think all the time. And so the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, that God comforts us in all things so we could comfort others. And in their troubles, we could comfort them in the same way that God has comforted us. And so for me to neglect my God's story, to neglect telling you the story of how Jesus massively altered and have impacted my life, not, not to tell you that so it would help you, that would be wrong. So... Humor me, please, because this is hard for me, honestly, so just humor me. So I want to start here. I used to work on a golf tour, 
uh, for professional golfers. And I was not a very good player, so, you know, please don't ask me to play golf because I don't like to play golf at all. But I do want to go to the Masters, just, just saying. <laughs> very soon, like it's this coming week, yeah, I think. Soon and very soon. So, uh, when I used to, I was, a, I was a tournament director and a rules official. So, I know it's hard to believe that golf actually has a referee because there's not too many fights and stuff, but, but there is a referee because we have rules. And so you have to enforce the rules and people don't know what to do because every golf course is a little different. So they need a guy or a gal to, to know the rules and be able to implement them. So I used to do that. Well, one of my favorite things to do when I, would, when I was working on the golf tour is when I'm at these golf courses, not the ones that are in subdivisions like down here, but the ones all over the other parts of the country where there's like just a golf course and they cut it into like the woods. It's really beautiful. Well, when I was driving down the fairways doing my job, before the tournament would start, during the tournament play, if I would see a dirt path in the woods, that just intrigued me. It always intrigued me. I don't know about you, but like I need to go down that path. I need to go down that path because it looks inviting and it looks like, man, something could be down there, right? And so you know, I, I would take these turns into the woods and I would go down this path because I always thought maybe, just maybe, I'd go down this path and it would open up into this scenic vista and there'd be this, this like mansion out there or a cabin in the woods or some amazing critter. And I would see something amazing and so I would go down these paths. Well, 99% of the time, it was a path that led to nothing except the maintenance crew was using it to dump their leaves and branches and stuff like that. That's, on occasion, you'd see like a deer or, you know, some fox or, so, you know, whatever. It was never anything awesome, but I couldn't resist the temptation to go down the path because it looked so inviting. So why the golf cart story? Well, these paths, they promised something but they never delivered. And I was like the ladies looking in the tomb. They were looking for the living amongst the dead, and I was looking for something big and beautiful and promising and life-giving in places that didn't offer it at all. But my looking in the wrong place was just a, was just a golf cart, right? It's just a golf cart and a golf path, so why does that even matter? Well, I thought that that was the end of it. But, you know, it says a minute, I said a minute ago that we're supposed to delight in his law and meditate on his word day and night. Why? Because it would bring life to you. And so I did, I don't want to just preach it, I want to do it. So as I'm meditating on this and I'm thinking about it over and over and over again all week long, I started to realize something. It dawned on me that the cart and these golf cart paths that promised something awesome but never delivered, it was just euphemistic for my entire life. That was who I was. I was just like those ladies. In Hebrews 10 last week, I shared with you that Jesus gave us a new life-giving way to live. But my ways, where I looked, was everywhere but there. I didn't even know. And maybe that's you. Maybe that's you. Maybe the ways that you choose to pursue life in abundance is, is these ways that really don't deliver. And so I have a message for you this morning, and it comes in a question. I don't know, are you guys ready to hear it? Do you want to, do you want to, do you come to receive something? Okay, so what I want to talk to you about is this, this, here's the question, put it up on the screen. Are your life-giving ways just dead-end streets? That's the question that I want to ask you, and you need to ask of yourself, and God's word is going to, speak directly to that. So we need to all choose our ways of life. We need to choose the avenues that we'll pursue for life and purpose and joy and happiness. We're all doing that, right? Well, here's the thing. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, this is a very familiar verse. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, the, the, I don't know about you, but if you, if you were in church at all, you know that these verses are used to preach about salvation. That there's no way you can go through Buddha or, or, or Tom Cruise or Oprah or any other religious thing, figure, framework, whatever. Like there's only one way to get there and it's through Jesus Christ. Did you ever learn that? Amen. Okay, so that's very, very true. What I want you to do is to do something that I've tried to do. I didn't grow up in church and so I try to read the scriptures with fresh eyes. 
I don't want you to just believe what I teach you. There's so much more to the Word of God than what I even could ever imagine or know. And so I want to do this. I want you to think about this. Don't think of it just as salvation. Think of it as life right now. He said, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Like, there's a way for you to live. It's my way. It's not just someday, like, you have to go through hell for 50 or 60 years. It's going to suck completely, but then someday it's going to get good when you finally croak. Like, that is not why Jesus came. As a matter of fact, he said in John 10, 10, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Now, does that mean life eternal forever? Yes. Would you agree? Yeah. But what about now? Is it supposed to suck real bad? Pardon my language. I, you know, I'm a work in progress, too. <laughs> but I, I just want to be real with you all, right? Yeah. I don't, I'm, I, that's just who I am. So, so, so it's not supposed to just be awful right now, and then someday it's going to be awesome and abundant and beautiful that's not really the way it's supposed to be. The, the NLT that we use here, it translates it this way so you can get the point of the abundant life. It's a rich and satisfying life, right? And I would venture to say that your very presence here today indicates to me that you want your life to be a little bit better than it is right now. Because if you were rocking it on all eight cylinders, you wouldn't be sitting here. You want it to get better. And Jesus said, I came to give you a better life, right? Not just someday. He, the word of God also raises the bar here in Colossians 3, 4. He says, the Bible says that, that Christ is your life. That he is your life. He's not just, he didn't just come to make your life better, but that Jesus is your life, right? That means he's everything. That means he's not part of your life, not even the most important, best part of your life. Jesus, what? Is your life. Like, I, if we didn't learn anything else other than that this morning, that's life-changing. Because we all think, well, it's my life, I can do what I want with it. No, you can't. It's my body, the lady will say. No, it's not. It's, if you're a Christian, it's Jesus' body. He owns you. You were bought at a price. The precious blood of Jesus bought you, ransomed you back from evil and into his kingdom. You're his child. You're not owned by yourself anymore. Christ is your life, right? That's, that's what he said. So, so he's everything, right? Apart from him, I can do nothing. So this radical thing that some people do of the church. Why do you go to church all the time? Why are you always going to church? Is that all you do is go to church? <laughs> well, what about church? What about, what are we doing in church? We're praying and we're serving and we're helping and we're worshiping. I mean, this is what we do, right? That's what Jesus wants for us. Studying his word, giving, gathering, reaching out, helping people. It's all worship. That's what Jesus wants for us. And he is our life. He's not something we squeeze into the nooks and crannies. He's our life. But see, the thing is, is much like a lot of people, I didn't care. I didn't give a rip. And I didn't know. Because nobody cared enough to tell me. I went over 30 years. Think about this. 30 years I went, and not one person shared the gospel with me. How is that even possible? How is it possible that in a country that claims to be three-quarters Christian, 75% of people in this country claim to be Christians, and a little well-to-do white suburban kid goes over 30 years and never hears the gospel? How does that even happen? It happens because people don't understand that Christ is your life. That it's not something you fit into the nooks and crannies. Some of us are here today, and you don't go to church, and you don't make praying and serving and worshiping and giving and gathering a priority. You're missing the mark. I lovingly will tell you that you're missing the mark. Because if you're a Christ follower, and you once said yes, and you meant it, then Christ is your life, not a part of it. Great. And so this is not something that's abnormal. It's not reserved for the radical Christian who goes to church on Monday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and reaches out to the community and has people in their home for, for worship and breaking bread and praying with one another. Like, No, that's what we're supposed to do. That's the average Christian, the everyday Christian Joe. That's what they're doing. That's what God called you to. 
But I didn't care because nobody told me. But this is good news. I love you. And so I'm going to tell you. I don't know where you're going to go after this, but you're going to know today. See, I had two gods. Me and the world. That's who I was. I didn't care about anything else. And so much like the path that looked good and promised something, I followed ways that looked good, but they were dead ends. And maybe you can relate with me. So my paths into the woods were, and I am not ashamed, I'm, you know, I, I wrote a book about it, you can, you can buy it, so I'm not hiding anything, but it was money, it was career, it was women, it was drinking, it was material, and it was marriage. They all promised life, but every single one of them were a dead end. And I, prom I thought that they promised the good life, and that's America, and that's what we go after, but I was wrong. I spent my first, the first portion of my life in a, in a home that was Jewish, but knew nothing of God. And then from the time I became a man, I'm not sure, I think I was a, a baby with a beard. But from the time I was 18 to about 35, I was chasing, sprinting down paths that I thought were going to have promise, but only finding another dead end. And you know what's really, really weird is that I lived all these years doing all this stuff, and many of you have or are right now. But you know what's incredible? If you rip open this old, old book, like thousands of years old, you're going to find that God addresses every single one of my paths. It's almost like he knew something. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm starting to get it. Right? Look in Luke chapter 12. Look in Luke chapter 12. Look at verse 15. Man, that's a beautiful sound. Whew. Praise the Lord. I want to say hello to uh, Philip and Beth in Michigan. I know you're watching and you're loved, and we are praying that you'll find a way back here. So verse 15 says, this is Jesus speaking. Beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Life, that's what we're talking about, life, right? Life is not measured by how much you own. Why didn't someone ever tell me that? Why didn't someone, why, why was not one person in 30 years in a Christian society, no one told me that? I was told otherwise. So I did. I pursued houses and cars and stuff, right? Over and over. Furniture and computers and jewelry and everything that you could ever want, right? All of us, that's what we do. Nobody ever told me. But then I found out that fads change and technology changes and styles change and jewelry breaks and it gets lost or it's gone when you buy your trophy wife a big fat rock the size of that tub and she leaves and pawns it for her and her boyfriend. Or so. I mean, I'm just telling you about what, what happens. Why didn't someone tell me this? That life is more than how much stuff I got. And you buy this stuff and the things change. And so what happens? I need another one. Right? I need the newest, the best, the most. Because the thing I bought six months ago that I thought was amazing and I needed it, it's not even in style anymore. So I got to buy the next best thing. This is the cat chasing its tail. That's what we do. Think of what the culture is teaching us. Just think about it for a second. TVs and phone and internet and billboards, more stuff, more stuff. If you get this and you get that and you need the newest phone, it's an iPhone 10 and it's only $800. And you need a 95-inch a, a flat screen because your 60-inch isn't good enough. Oh, we'll pray for you, Rich. 
more money, more stuff, more stuff. Listen, I, I, found some, I found some staggering information this week. This is amazing. Did you know that there are 50, this, is, this first number is not going to blow your mind, but there are 58,000 self-storage facilities in our country. That's not, I mean, it's a lot, right? But when you take into consideration the fact that the average storage unit um, business has 566 units, you learn that there's 33 million garages filled with a bunch of crap that you think you needed and you're going to store it until you realize you don't and then it's going on the curb and you're going to beg people to take it off your sidewalk. And that's what we do. Do you know what the self-storage business, the revenue for just this country last year, you ready? $22 billion. We're spending $22 billion on storing crap that you don't even need. Think about this. Do you know, I don't want you to feel guilty, but I'll just use a little Jewish guilt, because I'm Jewish, so. Do you know what it cost to put a well in in a drought-laden village in Africa, fully functioning, that can provide for them for 10 years? Five grand. And we spend $22 billion on bed frames you're never going to use, bunk beds for the kids that have already grown up and gone to college, tools you're never going to turn. Why? You saving the clothing for when you lose weight, you're not going to. <laughs> Do you see this? Okay. Get rid of it. Take the money instead of holding on to it to save for your clothing that's not going to fit and go buy Jenny Craig. Right? <laughs> Use it for something of value. We're wasting our money. So we're in Luke 12, right? Look at Luke 12, verse 22. And remember, the Bible says don't copy the world. And don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, right? So Luke 12, verse 22. Reading through 34. This is God's rebuke against what everyone's doing. He says, don't copy this, right? Then turning to his disciples, are you a disciple? Yes. Have you made Jesus your Lord and Savior? I don't know. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But if you are, that's you. And he says this to you. That's why I, Jesus, tell you not to worry about everyday life. Think about that for a second. Just think about that. In, 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 in the context of what the culture that you live in that's telling you what to do. And Jesus is saying, don't even think about that stuff. All that stuff that they're pushing down your throat of what you should do, don't, don't be like that. Listen, don't even think about everyday life. Don't even think about your basic necessities. Water, clothing, a house, a car, the things you think you need. Jesus is like, don't even think about that stuff. How can that be, Jesus? Am I supposed to walk around naked and walk to work and have no clothes? and I don't know, just... Israelites didn't have any food. Manna. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You don't think he'll provide for you? If you don't think he'll provide for you, then go find another religion. Just don't waste your time here. I'm telling you the truth. He says, don't, don't worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. For life, life, we're talking about life here, right? I came to you, you might have life and have it abundantly. Rich and satisfying. For life, this rich and satisfying life is more than food, and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. Ravens are the, the, the blackbird, the ugly, garbage-eating, get out of my yard thing, right? And that's the low end of the, of the food chain. But look at them, he says. Not the big, glor glorious, glamorous, bald eagle that I would provide for him with a soar on wings like eagles. No, the blackbird, the garbage eater. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for God feeds them. And you, that's you right now, you, 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 anyone here. You're far more, more valuable to God than any bird. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? 
I gotta work, I gotta work, I gotta work. I owe, I owe. It's off to work, I go. I owe, I owe, I owe, I owe, I owe, I owe, I owe. It's not gonna add a moment to your life. You're gonna have a stroke and die early, okay? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over big things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon, this elaborate, glamorous king, we don't get into all that, but just think of king, robes, crown, scepter, you know, gorgeous clothing, all that in his attire, the, the train of the robe, you know, all that. Even that guy, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautiful as the, the lilies in the field. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat or what to drink. These are basic necessities, Lord. Do you, not, do you even realize what you're saying? Yes, I do. Don't worry about such things. This is the stinger right here. Worrying about clothing and food and water. Basic necessities, Lord. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Really? But I think about those things all the time, Lord. Check your salvation. Check. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world, but your Father, this is encouraging, your Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and He will give you everything you need. Praise, Praise the Lord. So, so don't be afraid. I love this. This is so like... Oh, it's so cute, right? Don't be afraid, little flock. You know? You know, for all those tough guys out there who think I could, I got this on my own, you know what I'm saying? Right? He's like, oh, you're so cute. You know? He's like, don't be afraid, little flock. For it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Now listen. Sell your possessions and give them to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Whether, where your, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Amen. Awesome, right? Trust me, trust me. But that's not what the world's teaching you. Do you guys know who Malcolm Forbes is? Malcolm Forbes, like Forbes magazine? right? Rich guy. You know, our society follows the rich and the famous. We put them on TV. We see what they want, what they do, and we try to follow it. That's what our world teaches us. Can you bring up that picture, please? You guys, are, I'm sure you remember this. He was the one who coined this phrase, but he had, you know, billions of dollars. The one who dies with the most toys wins. You guys remember those bumper stickers? They were all over the car. It was in the 80s when he came up with this, and it just spread like wildfire across our nation. And it's still the air that we breathe today, except it got worse because there's more stuff available, more goods, more services. That's what we do. This was the sticker on, what is this car? How many in this room can buy that car even? Very few. But yet this is what's promoted. This is what is shoved down your throat all the time. You know, the lion, it occurred to me that the lion's share of American life is spent working to make money to buy stuff and to make enough money so that you can retire, and then after you retire, you can buy more stuff. Now tell me that's not true. When you go out onto the highway on Monday morning, out here on the roads, tell me that 90% of the people aren't going to work somewhere to go make money to buy some stuff. That's what we do. Those are our life-giving ways. This is how we live our life. And that's not what Jesus said to do. And so I think what we're doing is we're robbing ourselves from ultimate pleasure and joy and blessing because we're pursuing ways that we think have promise, but they're dead-end streets. And if you go down the, the highway that leads to Jesus, his way, you're going to see and experience something different than you've ever experienced before. But I can't tell you what it is because it's personal. And you've got to go down that road for yourself to find out what's down there. Amen. That's your pot of gold down there. It's not my pot of gold. My pot of gold is different than yours. If I could use that as an example. But that's different. And you've got to go after that thing. It's not like if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Like I can't give you a list of what it's going to look like exactly. I'm just saying that we rob ourselves of ultimate joy, purpose, fulfillment, and life when we choose other ways, not God's ways. And so, trying to 
make a bunch of cash, to buy a bunch of crap, is a dead end. And that's what we do. Well, I realized that was a dead end street. I also realize now that I'm probably never going to retire. But I did find some other things I like to do back in the day. If anyone can relate. I just like going drinking. I still like going drinking. One honest guy in here. I know you're going to say yeah. And you. All of you guys, you crazy drunks. But I used to like going drinking, you know. A few drinks, good ball game, maybe a girl. No harm, right? It's all good. Or so I thought. Remember I read that verse about life is more than just what you own and what you get. And all. I was like, man, why didn't someone tell me? Well, why didn't someone tell me about this too? Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. 30 stinking years and none of you guys told me this. I had to go and, and go down that road myself and realize the pain that it causes because nobody would tell me the truth that it's going to ruin my life. See, I was in this world just like you are and I'm, I'm promoted all this stuff. I'm put on TV and here's the Light Bear from Miller commercial and everyone's super. Do you ever notice the prettiest people are in these ads? And they're dressed so nicely and they're smiling and it's good wholesome fun. They're holding up their beer. Yeah, it's awesome. Everyone's laughing, having a good old time. Oh, this is great. But the reality is, is that your money is blown. DUIs, unwanted pregnancies, STDs, car wrecks, and people die. You wake up next to the highway in, 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 in bushes covered in urine. And you lost your phone and you lost your wallet and you cheated on your spouse and your, your, your kids are growing up with no dad because you're a one-nighter and people are dead because of your wreck. Am I just being too real for you guys? I mean, is it too real for, for Easter? Everyone's got their suits on in churches, right? But this is the reality. This is what we're living. And I lived it. And I, I was like Solomon. I didn't withhold any good pleasure from myself. And I learned that this was the reality. That it wasn't like the bear commercials at all. Jesus gave us a different way to live. A life-giving way to live. Remember Romans 12, too? Don't copy the rest of the world. This is what everybody's doing. Don't be drunk will ruin your life. But here's the next verse. Ephesians 5.19. I didn't, I didn't know this. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord. This is the church. How many people in here? Show of hands. You can praise them too. How many people in here have found that the Jesus party is more fulfilling and filled with joy than the beer, than the beer and the bottle and the bar, right? Awesome. That's what we do. He gave us a new way to live. <clears throat> so a different subject though I, um, last week you guys know that my aunt auntie, auntie we say aunt you know because from, I'm from Boston auntie Ellie so she passed away she had cancer and uh, so I went went over and I visited I went to go pick up my mom she was here from Massachusetts to visit she wanted to try to get to the house and say goodbye to her sister before she passed, but she wasn't able to get here on time. But she went to the house to be with her two daughters, Marlene and Heidi, and, you know, just to comfort them and stuff like that. And, and uh, so I was on my way to pick up my mom. Meredith had picked her up from the airport and brought her to Auntie Ellie's house. And she was there. She was ready to come back to our house for the night, though. And so I was on my way out to Deltona to pick her up. And I said... Uh, I want to come inside real quick and say hello to Marlene and Heidi. And she's like, oh, well, that's fine. But Moses, just please don't preach. <laughs> and it kind of breaks my heart, seriously, though. Like, I know it's, it is kind of funny and everything because they think that I'm crazy. But there was evidence that they needed to be preached to in what happened. And I didn't preach. I honored my mother's wishes. You know, you got to honor your mother and father. And that's, I'm not the Holy Spirit. God's got to do it. I can, we can pray. We can pray. But... I walked in and I said to Marlene, her older 
daughter, who's probably 51, 52 years old or something now, I said, so Marlene, other than this, how's it going? And she just looked at me and put her hand on her head and goes, this is everything. And I was like, man, really? I mean, it's, I mean, it's sad to lose your mom. I could get that, right? But <sighs> this is everything. Is it really everything? Like, that's your whole existence, right? That, like, it was a reminder of the shallow existence that people settle for. And this is her mom. Like, it's a big deal, but this is everything? Like, family is the prom For most, a lot of people in America, family is the promise of good life. We, we want to pursue the family, because the, the wife and the kids, and that's going to be pleasure and purpose. And I was like that, too. I thought marriage would solve my problem of no purpose and fulfillment. And, you know, we'll have a, a wife or a husband and have a few kids and a dog and a house and a car. And, you know, and my family is my life. And it's like that in America, big time. Family, family, family. And, and band and, and baseball and soccer and ballet. And we're going to go do all this stuff. And I'm going to find joy and happiness in that. And if I pursue those good things, all these, this other stuff of, of booze and women and, and all this debauchery, that's going to be dead now because I'm going to dead end. Dead end. And that's not easy to say especially when you're like sitting next to your wife or something, right? Like that's not, but it's a dead end. We got a 50% divorce rate in our country. The number increases on your second, increases on your third. Like the more times you try, the less chance of success. I tried three times because I thought that would be my life and purpose and Total dead ends. It's like my golf cart paths. But I want to give you some proper perspective. I want to give you a path correction. Luke 14. Are your ways life-giving or are they dead-end streets? Luke 14, 26. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, now listen, he said, I came that you might have life, rich and satisfying life. So if you want to be that guy or that girl, you got to have a perspective change. I came that you have life. That doesn't mean you came, you said yes, and then you do what you want and expect what he wants to give. No, that doesn't happen. You can't circumvent the system. He said this, if you want to be my disciple, you must. How much wiggle room? Show, show me how much wiggle room is in the word must. Show me. None, right? None. So there's no option here, is there? Would you agree? Okay. You must, by comparison, hate everyone else. That doesn't mean you hate them. You love them. Love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your wife as Christ loved the church, right? We're supposed to love. But in comparison, your love for them should be nothing, nothing compared for your love for Jesus Christ. Amen. Your father, your mother, your wife, children, brothers, and sisters, look at this. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Let me just throw this out there. Life-giving waves, maybe they're dead-end streets. Maybe you're pursuing family and family and band and soccer and baseball. I'm going to be a good dad. I'm going to be a good mom. Pour into my wife. Pour into my husband. All that stuff. But you're not, you're not wringing out of your life all that Jesus would have for you. Maybe it's because you're putting your family before your Savior. I'm just, there's a life-giving way. And family first is not it. Jesus first is it, okay? And I'll tell you one thing, and I learned this, guys, I'm talking to the men now, I don't know much about ladies, I don't know you, and I don't know, I don't know what it's like to be you, but I know for me, and the guys, you, you, some of you know this, and some of you need to hear it, that when you put Jesus first, you're going to be an, a rockin' husband. But you can try to be a rockin' husband, and not put Jesus first, and she's going to go find someone who's a rockin' husband. Just being real. Put 
Get the, vertic get the vertical right, and everything horizontal takes care of itself. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> Here's some more perspective, Luke chapter 9. Look at verse 59. Here what you see on displays is a bunch of different people saying, yeah, I want to be a Christian, yeah, I want to be a Christian, all of us, yeah, I want to be a Christian. And then, so Jesus says, yeah, come follow me, right? So he gave us all the invitation. He's giving you that right now. He's saying, hey, listen, I want you, you came here to Easter today. I want you to come follow me. Like, and I'm just telling you as the pastor of the church, unashamed, that's what we're here for. I want you to be a Christian. Jesus wants you to be a Christian. Everyone who calls this place home wants you to be a Christian. That's why the doors were open. That's why the lights came on is so that you could be a Christian today. Okay. So he says this, he says, come follow me. So the man says, yeah, I'll do that. The man agrees, but, hmm, here's that word. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. There's good butts and there's bad butts. Stop. <laughs> this place is holy. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. So listen, I think about that. I think about Marlene when she said that. This is everything. Mom's the most important thing, my family. And Jesus is like, some guy says, I want to go bury my dad. That's a big thing, right? What does Jesus say? The gall of this man. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Harsh, right? But it's in writing. It is written. So that's it. You want to be my disciple and live this abundant life that's beyond anything you've had or experienced so far? This is kind of what it's like. Priority. Me. I'm number one. Not mom, not dad, not brother, not sister, not your job, not your church, not your pastor, not your kids, not travel ball, not investments, not career. Me, me, me. Another one says, uh, Jesus says, come follow me. And the guy's like, yes, Lord. Lord, Lord. He says, Lord, Lord, Lord. That's a big thing, right? Someone calls you Lord. That's a big title. Yes, Lord. So what should come after Lord? Yes, right? Obey, right? Because that's Lord, right? So you'd think that's what it would say, right? I will follow you, but... Mm. Maybe this is us. Maybe this is your word. I want to follow you, but. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. Well, that would seem good. Like he's, he's shown that Jesus is first. Like the other guy didn't show that Jesus was first. I'm going to show you that Jesus is first. I'm going to go tell my family I'm out of here. I'm going to go follow Jesus. Not good enough. When Jesus says jump, you don't say how high. When Jesus says jump, what do you do? Jump. And while you're jumping, you say, Jesus, how high am I supposed to be jumping? Just start jumping. Right? That's what it says here. I want to go say goodbye to my family. No, that's not good enough. Anyone who puts a hand to the plow, like says they're going to follow me, and then looks back, not fit for the kingdom of God. Maybe you're not experiencing the rich and satisfying life that you want, that you're running down other paths to try to find. Maybe you're not experiencing it because you're not putting Jesus first. The thought of, of worshiping him daily, of singing to him, of praying, of serving, of giving, of helping, of outreach, that's not on your, even on your radar. You come to church on Sunday once in a while when it's convenient for you. That's not what it's all about. That's not going to get anything done. You're not going to experience the rich and satisfying life. And for those of us that have realized that the life that Jesus offers for us of serving and giving and gathering and helping and worshiping and studying God's word every day, all the time. When we are doing that, we're experiencing it, aren't we? And there's this thing inside of us that, man, we so desperately want the rest of you to experience that, whether it be at this church or another local expression. But just plug into the vine and experience this. Some of you might be in your seat right now thinking, I wish he'd stop talking. I'm ready to go. That breaks my heart. Just think about it. What's more important than this? 
What are you thinking about right now that's more important than this? Can we late for the game? Can we late for your lunch? Why do you worry about food and clothing? Jesus first, not family first. Jesus first is the life-giving way. I share with you that I had three previous marriages. You're in a church where the pastors had three failed marriages. Think about that. The first two, I wasn't a Christian. I had no idea. And I believe that the scriptures are true, that anyone's in Christ is a new creation. The old is dead. Behold the new man. So it's just done. My third try, I thought, well, I'm going to... It didn't work. <laughs> she said, see ya. I can't stop her. Grown woman, she makes the decision. But you might ask, well, why is it working now? Why does it seem that you and Meredith are going, going well? Like, why is this working? Let me tell you why it's working. Because when my ex left, I was sad. I was bummed out. And one day, I got tired of being sad. And I got tired of crying. And I was working at Bill Bryan Chrysler. And I walked out of the dealership and I went right behind this little silver Jeep Liberty and I got on my knees in the parking lot. And I said, Lord, I'm done being sad. I'm done crying. If it's just going to be me and you for the rest of my life, I'm good with that. Can I be real with you? You're not going to like shun me or, oh, I just got to tell you the truth. I'm about to say something. You might be offended, but I'm sorry. I said, I... If it's just going to be me and you for the rest of my life, that's fine. I just asked three things for you, of you. I said, I want to be a kick-ass dad. That's what I said. I'm just being honest. I want to be a kick-ass dad. I want to be the best employee I can for these people. I want to be the best pastor I can be for my church. I put Jesus first. And a week and a half later, Meredith walked into my church. And, and she knows, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that my love for Jesus is far, far above my love for her. And the reason why it works is because I realize that I'm her second husband. Jesus is her first. She loves Jesus more than she loves me. Jesus first, not me first. Jesus first, great wife. Jesus first, hopefully good husband. Jesus first, all the time. That's why it works. Do me a favor and, and turn to the Gospel of John, please. John chapter 12, we're getting close to the end. John chapter 12, verse 25 and 26. I love God's word. Why didn't anybody tell me this? Those who love their life in this world will lose it. <laughs> I was trying so desperately to fill my life with joy and happiness with things that never delivered. Some of you are still right now. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. <laughs> Second Timothy 2, 3 and 4, it says that soldiers don't get themselves wrapped up in the affairs of the civilian world. Because if they do, they can't please the officer that enlisted them. If you became a Christian, you became a new person. And you entered into a new family with new standards, new morals, new perspectives, priorities. Like you're in the Lord's army now. Remember that song? Because I'm in the Lord's army. <laughs> right? But you're in the Lord's army. And the Bible says we're not supposed to be wrapped up in the affairs of this old world that like everybody else is getting involved in. I went to go visit Blair last week, or the week before, right? We went to Fort Gordon. It's like a whole other world in there. Did you ever go to a, an army base? Or a marine? Or any of those bases? Like it's, it's like their own little world. They don't live by the same standards that we do out here. And God's saying, listen, if you're a Christian, you don't live by the same standards or values in the same perspectives as all the other people out there, you live in a different way. Because if you wrap yourselves up in the affairs of this world like everyone else, you cannot please the one who enlisted you. Do you know who that is? Jesus. Who wants to please Jesus? I do. So bad, I just want to hear him say, well done, right? Anyone? 
I just want to hear that. And he says, if you want to hear that, you can't, get, you can't be doing everything that everyone else is doing. You have to change your way. You have to change your way. Your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek first my kingdom and live righteously and he'll give you everything you need. So listen, it's Easter, man. It's resurrection day. And, and, and there's no doubt Jesus kicked death in the teeth and he rose from the, a cold tomb and he lives today. And that's awesome news. And we're here to celebrate that for sure. Jesus is definitely the baddest dude on the playground. And I get that. That's awesome. And if you're a Christian now, or you're about to say yes to him when we're getting ready to close, you're about to become a Christian this morning, maybe you feel it on you and you want to, like, that's awesome. And if that's the case, then, you, then because Jesus rose, you're going to rise. And, and he's, gonna, he's, gonna, he's there in heaven right now setting up a place for you. And one day the clouds are going to open up and Jesus is going to come down wearing a robe dipped in blood, a sword out of his mouth. He's going to have a tattoo on his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he's going to come gather you up and take, him, take you home with him. Like, that's awesome. But if I was a gambling man, and I'm not, but if I was, I would venture to bet right now that 100% of the people in this room are probably going to face tomorrow. And tomorrow, according to history, according to the odds, tomorrow's probably not the day that the clouds are going to open. It may, but probably not. And that means you're going to have choices again to make. That means there's going to be an opportunity for you several times a day, if not dozens of times a day, to make choices this way or his way. There's going to be paths you could take in the woods, and you could take your golf cart down there and sprint down there hoping for a promise and never seeing it, or you can do it his way. You have to make choices. So we're going to give our lives over to worshiping the Lord and working for the Lord and studying the word of God or is it going to be anything else? The life Jesus wants for you isn't just heaven someday. In Romans 8, 11, it says that the Spirit's desire is to give life to your mortal bodies. When's that? Yeah. Right now. The, the rich and satisfying life is for now. And we could choose it if we desire. It's Jesus and his ways or any other way, the choice is yours. Life-giving ways or dead-end streets. I close with this. Jesus is a way better pastor than I ever will be. And so I want to step aside and I want to let him close with an amazing offer. I'm going to bring it up on the screen and I would love if you would... You would Read this aloud with me. God's reading this over you. You know the Bible says in Zephaniah that he sings over us. So when you sing songs to him, which are just musical prayers, he's singing over you. So right now, let's just do this. Let's, let's read this amazing offer that Almighty God has given you today. Can we do that? And then we're going to stand and listen. We've got three songs to sing. And I would love it if you would honor the Lord and you'd, and you'd sing from the bottom of your heart praises to a, to a resurrected king that deserves it. So why don't we come to our feet, please. Come to our feet. And let's, let's just speak these words from the scriptures. And then I want you to, to sing. I want you to sing. I want you to declare his, his beauty and his power through music and let him hear you from this place today. Amen? Amen. This is what it says. Read it with me. Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Amen. Let's worship the king.